Grab your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1. I know we're uh, studying Genesis on the weekend, and um, I had nothing to do with choosing Genesis for our Wednesday night. Um, So if you like it, well, I'll tell you who was responsible for it. Wait a minute, if you don't like it. If you don't like it, I'll tell you who's responsible for it. I'm not going to even ask you if you like it or not. But, you know, they asked me, uh, yeah, I've been, when we had the groups, the, the different groups, uh, I've been kind of a floater. I've been a floater going around to different groups. And now they've asked me to teach some of these Wednesday nights. And so I hope you're happy about that. I don't know. I don't know. It's brief. They want me to be brief. That's the challenge, is being brief. And so I think I have about 25 minutes, so we break into our group somewhere around 7.30. And going back and looking at the days of creation, when I got my assignment, I must admit, uh, even though I've been teaching for all these years, when I went back and read Um, these verses that I've been assigned, my first thought was, what in the world am I going to say for 25 minutes off of these three verses? And I wasn't that happy about it. But look at them. God God tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and God said, God said, He spoke, let there be light. The verses before tells us that there was darkness. The Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. The deep there is the same word in the New Testament. We get the word abuso. It's the deep. And so God comes into a world that He's created, but it's, it's darkness, and He says, let there be light. Listen, when God comes in and says, let there be something, guess what? It's going to happen. And he says, let there be light, and there was light. Just like that. I'm very hopeful that we're going to be able to see, I don't know if they're DVDs, I don't know what they are, I don't know if it's Blu-ray, I don't know how we're going to be able to see it, but are we going to be able to go back and see some of these things that God did. Now, He's going to create new heavens and a new earth one day. We're going to see that. So maybe we don't need to go back and see this one. But God comes in and says, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And so there's debate. Was the darkness bad? And he separated the light from the darkness. That's fascinating. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. The most fascinating thing about this is that Not until we get to day four of creation, beginning in verse 14, all the way through verse 19, does God create the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's fascinating. So before you have the light of the sun, before you have the light of the moon, before you have the light of the stars... God brings light into a world of darkness. That's fascinating. Calls the light good. Separates the light from the darkness. There's evening. There's morning. There's no sunrise. That's what, there's no sunrise yet. There's no moon that comes out at night. There's no stars. There's light, 
and there's darkness. And God separates them. Now, let's get a little theological, okay? Just, just briefly. I'm, I promise you we're not going to stay here. But there's a thing called the gap theory. The gap theory. For those of you that have been around for years, you might remember a Bible years ago called the Schofield Bible. A few of you nodding. In the Schofield Bible, in the notes, it advocated for what's called the gap theory. What is the gap theory? Well, the gap theory is the belief that between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, there's a gap of time. And those who would hold the gap theory believe that God created the world, but something happened. Something happened. Judgment. And the world is in a chaotic state in verse 1. And time passes, and those who withhold of the gap theory believe it could be millions of years that pass between verse 1 and verse 2, where God comes now and he begins to refashion a world that's in chaos. That's the gap theory. And you might think, do you believe in the gap theory? I can't because my wife doesn't. (laughs) Those who hold the gap theory accept the Bible literally. They're they're, they're literalists, so they're not bad guys, gals. They're, They're not. They also accept the claims of modern science about the age of the earth. And when you hear, you know, scientists say, you know, millions and millions of years for something to happen. For them, the gap theory provides the solution to the time and fossil problem, placing the geological ages between verse 1 and verse 2. Now, I told you we're going to get theological for a moment. That was it. All right. That was it. I'm not going to ask you if you believe in the gap theory. How many of you have never even heard of the gap theory until I just said it? Never even heard of it. Well, I should have just kept my big mouth shut. (laughs) Because in my opinion, and it's a very strong one here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You meet somebody and they believe in the gap theory, that's okay. They can believe in the gap theory, that's okay. What matters is what we're to learn from this. Whether the gap theory is true or not, and, you know, there's darkness because of some judgment, you know, and those that would hold to the gap theory would also believe that Satan, thrown to the earth, you know, because of his rebellion against God, and Satan is the source of all the darkness and all the chaos, and so God now comes back in, and he begins to refashion, and as he does, he creates in six days, and on the sixth day, he creates man, but Satan's already here, and so there's all these theories. The important thing is, the important thing is, God created the world, there's darkness, and God says, hey, I'm I want to bring light into the darkness. He separates the light from the darkness. So what do we learn from that? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm telling you, I, after really studying it and thinking about it, they gave me the best, best verses of every win- This is the best night right here. <laughs> so don't foolishly debate and focus upon the non-essentials and the things that aren't clear. I'm going to give you a verse, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Some of you are already nodding your head. The secret things belong to the Lord. God hasn't told us everything, and everything's not clear. Is the gap theory right? I don't know. I don't particularly buy it because I'm married. And my wife doesn't believe in the gap theory. But we talk about it. You know, we've talked about it. But, you know, hey, light 
darkness. What do we learn from that? What does the Bible teach us from the physical light and the physical darkness that laid us spiritually and practically? Well, let me throw some verses out. All right, let me throw some verses out. John chapter 12, verse 46. Listen to this. John 12, 46. Jesus said, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. That's cool. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Listen to this. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, and now he's referring back to Genesis, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. The fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, let me give you three truths from the text, and then we'll break into our groups. Number one, light illuminates my path. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Years ago, God showed me that's both short-term daily guidance and that's long-term perspective as well. I came in from vacation. We didn't get back till late Saturday evening, so we weren't able to be at the Saturday night service. Didn't you enjoy Pastor Glenn? Didn't he do a great job? Well, I was here Sunday morning, not teaching, but I was here Sunday morning. I came in, and um, I didn't have my key with me, so I couldn't get into the green room, and I knew they were already starting to pray back here. And so I came up the stairs here, and I went in this door, but it was dark. And I pushed open the door, and guess what happened? I fell headlong into the green room in the midst of the prayer meeting. I was so embarrassed, I jumped up as fast as I could and ran out of there. <laughs> and I was hurting. I hurt my knee, hurt my shoulder, and I fell. Why? Because I couldn't see. Needed some light. Didn't hit the step right. Light's extremely valuable. I'm just trying to drive at night without headlights. Light illuminates my path. Second thing about light. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Boy, the battle in the world is between light and darkness. Ephesians, I think most of us know this is a chapter that deals with the spiritual armor that God's given us to live in victory. But notice verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this, what? Dark world. This dark world. He's not talking physically there, he's talking spiritually and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Jesus, in Luke chapter 22, verse 53, when they came to arrest him, he said, Every day I was with you in the temple courts. You didn't lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. It's fascinating and sometimes perplexing when God allows the darkness to temporarily reign in order to accomplish His will. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that Judas, all the rulers that ended up putting Jesus on the cross, they never would have done what they did to Jesus had they understood of the wisdom of God in allowing darkness for that hour 
to put Jesus on the cross. It was in the wisdom of God. And sometimes we don't understand why God allows the darkness. One last point, and then we'll break up. One day all the darkness of this world is going to be dispelled. can't wait for that day I sometimes pinch myself and it, it really is true I really I'm really going to experience him one day I'll never have to deal with the darkness again Colossians 1 verses 12 and 13 giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. I don't know if you were there. Uh, even if you were there, it's hard to remember messages that someone's given. Even my own messages, I have a hard time remembering. But sunrise service last year down at the Mahaffey Theater, the whole topic was on darkness and how God has brought light into a world of darkness. One last verse I'm going to leave with you. Now, I haven't covered any of the verses that you're going to talk about in your discussion groups. I was very careful about that. So the verses you're going to get to in your discussion group, we haven't even touched. But Revelation chapter 2 verse 5 is one of the greatest verses in or 22, I'm sorry, verse 5. It, it's just, <laughs> I, I could just meditate on this verse. This is after God creates new heavens and a new earth, and it's the place where I'm going to dwell with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And if you know Jesus is where we're all going to dwell forever and ever and ever. And here's what it says. There will be no more night. They will not leave the, need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. There will be no more night. I am looking forward to the discussion about light and darkness, and I hope you are too.